All right, let's go ahead and talk about the periodic table. The very first thing we're going to do is talk about the history of the periodic table. It was developed by a Russian chemist named Mendeleev. And originally, the order of the periodic table was in atomic mass. And you know, as we've looked at the periodic table recently, that it's actually now in the order of atomic number. And mostly in English, where scientists have discovered that arrangement for the elements. So now it's arranged by atomic number, but originally it was arranged by atomic mass, which is the bottom number under each element symbol. Now, just a few definitions we need to make sure that we are familiar with. Periodic law, which means that the properties of elements are going to change in a regular pattern over the periodic table. And so they're arranged in the order of increasing atomic number, and then we're going to look at some properties of elements and their trends in just a moment. Period is the horizontal row of elements in the periodic table. So horizontal, if you do not know, means like the horizon, so it means left to right. So the rows of elements going left to right are known as periods. A group is the vertical column of elements in the periodic table. Those are the columns that go up and down. And so we, may, we call those periods and groups. Now, a period can also be known as a series, and then groups are also called families. Now, some trends that we see across the periodic table, we're going to look at now. The elements become less metallic across each period. So as you move from left to right across the periodic table, if you look at the picture that you have in your notes, as you move left to right, your um, metallic properties decrease because your metals are on the left-hand side, your non-metals on the right-hand side. So as you move left to right, the metallic properties decrease and become less evident. Now, atomic radius is how large an atom is. And that increases as you go down a group, and it decreases as you go across a period. Ionization energy and electronegativity, they trend the exact same way. They increase as you go left to right, and they decrease as you go from the top of the periodic table to the bottom of the periodic table. Now let's look and see what those two things are. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from an atom. So ionization energy is stronger on the right-hand side of the periodic table than it is on the left-hand side. Electronegativity is the measure of the ability of an atom to attract other electrons. And so that also, the electronegativity is going to be stronger on the right-hand side than it is the left-hand side. And it's going to be really important for something we talk about in just one moment. Okay, really quickly, I want to kind of explain, especially the atomic radius trend. Let's look at our periodic table. And if you think about it, over here at hydrogen, right here on this column, we all of them have one valence electron. So that means over here, like lithium, Right? It's got three electrons, and as we did our Bohr models, um, I'll do one here for us, um, but lithium has one on the outside, right? So it has one valence electron. So that entire column has one valence electron. However, the protons keep increasing as you go down. And if you'll remember our atomic force, the protons and electrons are attracting one another. When you have um, more protons, and more electrons, they also, they pull in because that attraction gets larger. However, since the valence electrons stay one, they actually tend to not be able to pull in as much. So they, they tend to get larger. So you might start out, you know, with our atomic radius, you're going to get larger and larger as you go down because you increase protons, but that valence electron, you don't have enough electrons to be increasing and pulling that atom in. So the atomic radius tends to get larger and larger. Now, as you go left to right on the periodic table, you actually, you're increasing uh, protons, but you're also increasing those valence electrons. So it actually kind of pulls the atom and the element closer in together, which keeps the atomic radius from getting larger. And actually going across, we tend to get a little bit smaller as we travel across the periodic table. Okay, and as my proportions probably wouldn't work out going all the way across, but you get to see the picture to show what atomic radius does. Now, lithium, 
up here that we've already drawn, drawn let's compare it to something like fluorine. Because fluorine has nine electrons. So let's see, the first level is going to have two. And the second level, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine has seven electrons. Don't you think it's much easier to pull this electron off than it would be to pull all seven of these off? And that's where ionization energy and electronegativity come in. Ionization energy is the energy it takes to pull off an electron. So it's going to have, lithium has low ionization energy because it doesn't take a lot to pull off one electron. Fluorine has a lot of ionization energy because it takes a lot of energy to pull seven electrons off. And so this is kind of an explanation of some of those periodic trends that we were just discussing. Now we're going to look at the role electrons play in the periodic table and how they affect the periodic trends and also how they affect the chemical properties of elements. Now remember, the periodic trends um, are trends that happen across or down the periodic table and they are the result of electron arrangement. Now valence electrons are those on the outermost energy level of an atom or an element. And if you have the same number of valence electrons, then you have similar properties. So a group or a family is going to have similar chemical properties. Elements that have one valence electron are, tend to be highly reactive, and they form ions very quickly and become charged. And we're going to talk about ion formation next. Now, ion formation. Everything that we've looked at on the periodic table so far, each element has no charge. It's perfectly balanced. It has, um, for instance, carbon has six protons, six electrons, so their charges cancel each other out, which gives it a net charge of zero. Now we're going to talk about ion formation. Ion is an atom, radical, or molecule that has either gained an electron or it's lost an electron. And if they gain electrons, that means they're going to become more negative because they're taking more negative charges in. If they lose electrons, they're going to become more positive because they lose those negative charges, which gives them a more positive charge. So if an atom gains or loses an electron, it no longer has that equal number of electrons and protons. Then the charges don't cancel out, so the atom or the element then has a net charge. Now, forming positive ions. Positive ions are also known as cations. And in just a moment, you're going to hear that negative ions are called anions. And the way I try to remember that, even though I don't really like cats, cations, cats, are a more positive thing to me than ants. And ants, or anions, form the negative ions. And that's just how I remember it in my head. Cations are formed when an element does not have many valence electrons. So that means they're easily removed. So a cation becomes positive because it's losing that electro those electrons or those negative charges. Now these are going to be your metals. Your metals are the ones that are going to lose electrons easily and form positive ions. Make sure you know the metals, the groups 1, 2, and 13 of your elements are the ones that are forming positive ions. They're going to give away their electrons and become positive. Now negative ions, they're also called anions. And anions are formed when an element's outer energy level is almost full, so it steals an electron from another element so that it can fill up its outer le level. That means it's gaining electrons, it's putting more negative charge into the element or atom, so then it becomes negatively charged. Okay, really quick, I wanted to talk to you about the positive ions and negative ions again. Let's look at lithium and fluorine one more time in this video. And as you can see, lithium has that one valence electron, and so it's easier for something to take it away than for something to take fluorine seven electrons away. And if you're over here by yourself, wouldn't you rather be with seven friends somewhere else? And so that's kind of how I think about it. So lithium is actually going to give this electron to the fluorine. Because then it gives, remember, the fluorine wants eight on its outer layer. That's what makes it the happiest. So this way, fluorine can be happy, but then lithium can be happy because it then has an outermost layer that's full. Because remember, the first energy layer is full with two. So this way, both become happy, and lithium then becomes a positive ion or a cation because it lost its negativity, and fluorine then becomes a negative ion because it gained negativity. Now, for your summary, what I'd like you to do is I want you to do a 3-2-1 summary. 
I would like you to write three very important things that you've learned from today's video. I would like you to write two questions that you still have that need to be answered. And I would like you to write one interesting thing you learned today. Have a great evening and I'll see you in class.